Sean, you're not prioritizing your family right now. Instead of me getting upset, because in my head, I'm thinking, I just, I just work for, yeah, everything I do is for this family. You know what I'm saying? I just work 12 hours, and went and got my kids, and go to these meetings, all this other stuff. What I do is, and when I say being in terms of sacrificial lamb, she's coming for me. I'm like, you know what? I'll be willing to be the sacrifice. You know what? You're right. Listen, it's the message right here. Black boy, tell me how you really feel. Cause I just want to build with you. Black girl, tell me how you really feel. I want to keep it real with you. I want to live better, eat better. I want to love better, sleep better. Yeah, I want to feel so aligned. Man, how how would you describe the process that you went through to vet your former wife? And how is it different from the process you went through to vet your current wife? My first wife, I don't think there was too much of a vetting process. We did get counseling. We did get some counseling, you know, from the church and stuff like that, from the pastor. Um, and to me, because I trusted my pastor, I, I felt like that was that stamp of approval. Like we were already talking, but getting that counsel and I was like, OK, I think we'll be good with uh, with my ex-wife. And then, like I said, I felt like there was a little pressure on my behalf of, like I said, you need a wife kind of thing and you're doing ministry and you need a woman that's by your side and all the other good stuff. And she fit the the church woman mold. Um, now, with my wife who I'm married to now, with her, she was, she was, she was fun. She was a friend. Mm. My ex-wife, I think what we went wrong with my ex-wife was we weren't friends. We weren't best friends. My wife now, we best friends. So if I do something that causes any pain to her or frustrates her, I look at her as like, I don't want to hurt my friend. Mm. So that makes a difference in having a friend. So you mentioned the church. You mentioned the church being part of um, the reason why you idealize marriage um, and, and in some way jumped into it prematurely or overlooked some compatibility differences. Um, Part of what I think happens, especially with good men who come from the church, is they have these Puritan expectations that they project on women. And it kind of cripples their ability to vet women, number one. But number two, I think it also um, it leads to the woman on her side feeling trapped in a way. Um, and that's where you get stuff like nice guys finish last, because sometimes she doesn't feel like she can be herself with the nice guy. So what is your take on the whole nice guys finish last? How do you think it relates to the church? Where do you think there's a disconnect? I think the disconnect is, I, well, I think the church is starting to do a better job as far as trying to relate to just everyday people now. Mm. I think the church, because they realize that I've lost an audience, especially with social media and everybody's woke and you know, you can do your own Bible study. You can be your own theologian. So I think the church is realizing I need to really be honest about sex, about, you know, women, all those other things. So I think in the era that I grew up in in church, you know, you're talking about maybe early 2000. So I think with the good guys finished last thing, I think that was probably a huge thing in the early 2000s because you look at a guy like a good church guy. And it's like, oh, lady say, you know, I want a man who prays for me. Like you got the meme where the man and the woman is in the church and he's crying with his hands up and she's like falling out or whatever. I think that's the the way people look at ideally a good church man. Like I'm just always going to be praising the Lord and I'll never uh, turn you down for anything. I'm going to make sure that I'm just a perfect man for you. But then you realize that you got to do everyday life outside of the church. You realize that we're going to have disagreements. We're going to have fallouts. And does that negate me being a good guy now because we're not getting along? So I think the image that we have of a good guy is just 
good church man, yes man, I'm gonna do whatever is required of me, opposed to no, this is real life and there's gonna be some issues and things where we fall out and we don't see eye to eye. And am I strong enough to be okay with saying no to you, to you, mm. you know, and still being able to walk as a man of God, you know what I'm saying? And still make that work. So I think that's where the good guys, and I could be wrong as far as the way women see it, but I know for men, cause I fell in that good guy category. And the minute you have those disagreements, women look at you weird. So I think that uh, being able to walk in, in, your, in your truth, as they would say, uh, and still be a good guy regardless of turning her down for whatever and saying no and disagreeing, I think that's, that's important for you to still be good with who you are as a man. Absolutely. So <laughs> I want to preface this question with this, with this statement. And I think you would be perfect to speak to it. The dating landscape that we have to navigate now in the 21st century is very different from what our parents, their parents had to navigate. Not only do you have access to every bad woman in your city, you got access to all the baddies all over the world. Um, that, you know, travel is more accessible. Uh, you have social media, you have dating apps. Um, and you also have the, the whole, you know, uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's seeing the highlight tapes of everybody else. So it's like, I don't want to lock myself down because I might be missing out on this plethora of opportunities. So and going back to, you know, sex is also easier to come by. Um, you know, the, the whole Lori Harvey situation she was talking about, you know, at 26, I'm not ready. Yeah, yeah. You know, so also with with medicine and with female empowerment, um, the sense of urgency that used to uh, lead some women and some men into monogamy mm -hmm. is no longer as powerful. So the question is, can our traditional paradigm of marriage and companionship still work today? It can. I, I believe it can. I think it just depends on your value and your priorities. Uh, I was talking the other day about having the strength to say, the self-discipline to say no as a man. I mean, I got Instagram too. I, I see baddies. I see, you know, everywhere, but I'm not trying to lose what I got at home mm. for some baddie. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I've been around for a while. So are you willing to sacrifice the, 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 the woman you have at home for one night of pleasure with a baddie. Because no shade to the baddie, but you don't know all the issues that she got going on. You don't know what's going on behind the screen. All you know is that she's cold. That's all you know. But as, as Chris Rock would say, you know, uh, can, can, new, can new pussy cook? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Can, you know, that whole thing. So you have to think about that. Are you willing to just sacrifice everything for one night? Or are you going to have the self-discipline to be like, she cold, but I got to keep it moving. So I think it depends on your value system. And we live in an instant, uh, instant society now. I just got to have it. So a lot of people uh, don't believe in delayed gratification. Well, let me, let me, let me ask you that. Like, what would you say about young brothers like myself saying, um, until, <laughs> shout out to coming to America, until I've sown my royal oats properly, until I've, you know, I've built up um, a certain status, I've, I've got, you know, my money together and things like, because, you know, to cultivate a relationship takes time and it takes intentionality. And if you're out here trying to get it, you know, it's easy for a woman to feel deprioritized. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to the, to the, to the, uh, to the younger, um, younger men about when is the right time for them to put their mission to the side and go get you a woman and go focus on her versus the freedom that we enjoy as men and being able to move around and be in Thailand and this place and that place. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Again, you got to have that discipline. I, I, I think that as a young man, I always tell people to choose purpose over panties. You know what I'm saying? Choose your purpose over panties because you can be locked in 
and doing what you need to do as a man and not get distracted by women. Now, don't get me wrong. I get it as a man. I, I love women, too. I get it. But if there's anything I've learned over time, because when you get married, like there's going to be times when she ain't in the mood for sex. What you going to do then? Uh, it's that time of the month. What you going to do then? You know, y'all fell out. She ain't trying to get it in. Just different things. She have a baby. Right. All those different things. If you don't understand, if you don't get the self-discipline ahead of time before you end up settling down, it's going to be issues. Uh, and that's why some guys cheat. I, I think even you you referenced one time you said guys like uh, quantity over quality. You know what I'm saying? Which I totally agree because that's why guys do what they do for the most part. But that makes commitment hard. Mm. So you used to sleeping around, sleeping around, getting, you know, you're knocking all the women up, you get, you know, but not knocking them up, but you know, you getting it in. And then all of a sudden you just expect to stop everything and get married because now all of a sudden you met the woman of your dreams and you think all oh, that's just going to go away overnight. You used to getting it in with as many women as possible. So you're going to get frustrated the first time she tell you no. And then is that one woman actually enough for you? Mm. I think that's the problem with a lot of men that, you know, they might go out or whatever. They just used to sleeping around. What's the most difficult part about marriage? Um, what slash, what do you miss the most about being single? The freedom. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the freedom, the, the freedom, check this out. Okay. Not the freedom of women, the freedom of purpose. Because for me, and, and I don't know if you know, like, okay, I got, I have four kids total, but three of them is with me. I have a 19 year old daughter. She's in the state. She's doing her own thing. But two of my boys have autism, two of my, my, my little boys. So I have to spend time to make sure that they're good, go to meetings, all these different things. So if I'm trying to get out content, I got to make sure the home front is good. And then I can do that. So I miss that sometimes even going through my divorce. At the time, I was able to, to chase my purpose. You know what I'm saying? I was able to record and do as much as I wanted to because I didn't have a woman in my life. So my biggest thing is, man, that's that's probably what I miss the most about being single. What after being married to your current wife and even to your ex-wife as well, um, have you learned any like paradoxical truths about women? Like we we think women are like this, oh, but they really yeah. like this. <laughs> yeah. I've learned with women, you just gotta be a good listener. Mm. Man, if you can listen, put the phone down. If you give her that attention, that quality time, and you gotta understand what her love language is, because every woman is different. Cause I think one of the issues with men is, you know, even just in, in we're looking for rules. <laughs> yeah, right. Like yeah. even in a sexual sense, if we having sex with a woman, we think we can have sex with different women the same way that we had sex with the, the previous woman, but that's not her. So you trying to do your moves? She like that ain't working. You know what I'm saying? So you got to really take the time to give this woman a clean slate and say, "This is what she like. I'm learning. This is what." she's really into my wife now she love uh acts of service mm. she's like can you go get the boys from daycare after you finish working 12 hours um can you help me clean this kitchen but i've learned it over time like i fold clothes i wash it man whatever needs to be done because if i'm speaking that love language she she feels like she's being heard she's feel like i'm paying her the attention that that she deserves absolutely Absolutely. One of the questions that I get from a lot of women, particularly um, with regards to the series, is conflict resolution. How would you say from your perspective has been the most effective way to resolve conflict, uh, whether in this marriage, the other marriage or like even in your you know, friendships um, with women or you know, family members? Man, conflict resolution is it's so slept on. What works for me is. I'm more of a, I've learned you have to be, you have to be more of a sacrificial lamb. You have to understand how they want to be loved. So for example, my wife and I, we get into it. Uh, we fall out. She's coming from my neck. She's like, cause that's what she's used to. 
But for me, I'm more of a laid back kind of person. So if she's saying what she needs to say to me, I'm not going to combat that. I'm not going to be defensive. So say, uh, Sean, you're not prioritizing your family right now. Instead of me getting upset, because in my head, I'm thinking, I just... I just everything work for yeah, everything I do is for this family. You know what I'm saying? I just work 12 hours and we got my kids and go to these meetings, all this other stuff. What I do is, and when I say in being in terms of sacrificial lamb, she's coming for me. I'm like, you know what? I'll be willing to be the sacrifice. You know what? You're right. What can I do to make this better? Let her talk. By doing that, you disarm. Cause she's coming with the M16. She's cocked and she can't wait to have these conversation with you. Cause she understands the dance that y'all have. She understands that if I say this, he's going to say that. So you create this dance of miscommunication because you know how she's going to respond. She know how you're going to respond. But once you break that dance and do something different, it unarms her. Now, all of a sudden she's looking at you like, I got to dance. I got to get with your rhythm now. So if I'm willing to be sacrificial now, when my wife and I have conversations, guess what? I've mirrored that to her. Now she sees what it looks like. So when I'm ready to chew her head off, she's looking at me like, you know what, baby? Right. How can we, what can we do to fix this? Unarming the situation because you, with a relationship, you can't fight fire with fire. You're going to burn the whole relationship. Somebody got to be the sacrificial lamb. Somebody has to be emotionally mature. There's a there's a there's a there's a book by David Dita. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what's it called? Way of the Superior. Way of the Superior Man. Have, have you read it? I read it. What you're describing is pretty much that, right? Like he talks about how uh, a good woman is going to challenge you, and your ability to navigate that inevitable challenge from the female dictates your level of superiority as a man. I have qualms with it a little bit okay. because, you know, there are some women who get off on the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so my, my question is for the brothers who might be listening and saying, why should we allow women to just stir up bullshit for the sake of stirring up bullshit? Why should we allow women to disrupt our peace? Why should we allow women to say we're not doing enough, even though we are doing 12 hours in this this, distance? So how would you respond to those men who are saying, you know what, if that's what marriage is, a companionship is, I don't even want it. Or we now see the passport bro saying, well, this this foreign woman, the stuff I'm doing for her is extraordinary. So how would you respond to that? Man, everybody got issues. No, no, nobody, man, we just beautifully broken. Everybody got issues. Nobody is free from it. So I think a lot of it comes down to knowing the woman's emotional maturity, like we talked about before. And sometimes we can't see past that because she got a small waist, you know what I'm saying? And them thighs banging and she got them heels on. So the he- the click of the heel just messed up everything in your head and what you thought, what, you know what I'm saying? So you can't even get past the conversation She's giving you details and how she is as a woman. She's telling you, again, it boils down to communication. You got to understand what she's telling you. Because a lot of times as guys, we can tell if she's full of drama or not. For my wife and I, man, she, she, she not on that. You know what I'm saying? Because she see how I roll. To me, as a man, I feel like we're leaders. So I'm going to start with the man first. So I can't hold a woman. A good, should women be accountable? Yes. Okay. But as a man, change start with us. I always tell people, change start with me. If my wife is a mess, it's because I'm a mess. You know what I'm saying? So if I'm a leader, I'm going to inspire her. I can't change her, but I can inspire her. And if she's an emotionally mature woman, she's going to end up... Because all women, they want to be loved. And if you give her that environment, like she'll change. But it starts with you first. There's another book I referenced by uh, James Sexton. Uh, it's called If You're in My Office, It's Already Too Late. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right said, yeah. oh, my God. So yeah. oh, with, my with that being said, I think it ties perfectly into your brand, Scary to Remarry, right? Because James Sexton is a 20-year divorce attorney. Yep. Uh, I think, like, lead attorney is also, like, 20-year divorce attorney. Mm-hmm. 
And and as men, especially nowadays, we're starting to share notes about how scary it is <laughs> yeah, yeah. to marry and remarry. So what is your perspective? And then segue that into why why did you call your brand scary to remarry? What's your perspective on that? Yeah. From a personal perspective, I remember going through my divorce in my apartment by myself after 15 years crying in the shower. I, I wasn't in a fetal position. I didn't have my, my knees on my elbow. I, you know, I didn't do that, but I was in the shower crying and I'm just thinking, man, I didn't give up on love. I want to do this again. My heart is still open. And I was crying because of it felt like a death of starting over again and having to find myself. I had to deal with my personal issues. So the, behind a brand is scary to remarry is once you get out there, you're thinking, OK, I know what marriage is like, but now I have to give this person a clean slate, whoever I'm dealing with now. And am I willing to put my best foot forward? Because I believe that if you're going to go into a relationship, go into a wholeheartedly. If you're not going into a wholeheartedly, then you didn't get a relationship. It's chance. So you worry, like, do I really got what it takes to do this again? Am I, am I emotionally healthy enough? Am I spiritually healthy enough? Financially healthy enough? Am I mentally? All these different things you ask in yourself because now you're about to embark on a new journey. And if you're secure enough to say, I'm willing to put my heart back out there again, uh, that's what it's scary to me, Mary, is all about. It's facing your fears and being honest that I'm willing to take this journey again. Hopefully this time more mature than the last time. How would you encourage men to think about, for instance, the 50% divorce rate, the 80% rate of it being fought by women, the family court system, alimony, child support, um, in the face of these potential threats and challenges, um, how would you encourage or how would you help men form the proper perspective on these things? Mm. It's real. I, I, I paid <laughs> child support and alimony <laughs> over a year. So I, 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 I get it. And that's just like life. That's like any chance we take. I, I mean, you get in your car, you're taking a chance. Marriage, you're taking a chance. I caught a flight to, kick, to get out here. I took a chance. So just like any other chance we take, marriage is the same thing. You know what I'm saying? And then are you going to be committed to see this thing through? Uh, I had a friend of mine. She told me, she said, Sean, you went through a divorce. She said, just do what you just do the right thing. She said, because if you do the right thing, it's going to pay off for you later. I honestly believe one, I think I doubled up on my child support payments one time. Like I wasn't playing. I think one of the reasons I have the wife I have now is because I followed suit. I went through a divorce. Was I pissed? Yeah, but I did it. I paid it. And I believe that gave me more peace at the end of the day. So if you have to do that, do it. Absolutely, man. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> man, just like that. That's, a wrap. Damn, that's, that's a wrap. crazy. That's